A Supreme Court judge in Brazil has ruled that all prisoners whose second appeal is currently before the court should be released while it's still being heard. It's a decision that could affect the current prison sentence of former president, Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva, who's been in jail on corruption charges since April of this year. Following Judge Marco Aurelio Melo's decision, Lula's attorneys have called for his immediate release. But it still isn't clear if or when the ru ruling can be implemented, since Melo's decision must next be considered by the full panel of the Supreme Court. We're happy because this establishes a constitutional precedent. The session of Judge Marco Aurelio is extremely important for the Brazilian legal process and for the defense of the Constitution. We have already taken all the necessary judicial measures for the release of the former president. Our correspondent Brian Meir explains. This afternoon, Supreme Court Minister Marco Aurelio issued an injunction calling for the immediate release of all Brazilian prisoners who are awaiting their appeals processes to play out. Now, this has a direct ramification for ex-president Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, who was thrown in jail after the Supreme Court made a ruling last April, making an exception to Article 5 of the Brazilian Constitution, which stipulates that people can only be imprisoned after their guilt has been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now, immediately after Aurelio issued the injunction, Lula's defense team filed a motion for habeas corpus for him to be released today. Leaders of the PT party, labor union, activists, and social movement activists are all traveling to Curitiba right now, where they're gathering in front of the federal police headquarters where Lula has been held in solitary confinement since last April. Meanwhile, however, Supreme Court President Dias Toffoli has announced that he might try to overturn the injunction. For him to do this, he has to receive a legal request from the Attorney General's office. Attorney General Raquel Dodge is meeting with advisors right now, trying to figure out how she can do this. And so, although there's some indication that Lula could still be released tonight, there are people working to try and block this from happening. And only time will tell whether he will remain as a political prisoner or he'll be free by Christmas. The Guatemalan Ministry of Foreign Affairs has asked the United States to open an investigation into the death of Jacqueline Cal. The seven-year-old migrant died while in the custody of U.S. border agents. The Foreign Affairs Minister also said that the documentation necessary to repatriate Jacqueline's body is ready and she will be returned to her family in Guatemala. And deported migrants have protested against U.S. migratory policies in Mexico City. Demonstrators from Mexico and Central America gathered in front of the U.S. Embassy in the Mexican capital. They protested against U.S. policy and demanded justice for migrants. <laughs> What is happening on the border of Tijuana gives me a feeling of solidarity. We know what it is to have to leave our countries for better opportunities, to be separated from our families and face difficult situations such as the risk of deportation. Donald Trump's family are migrants as well, so I don't understand why he's being so racist towards us. We only want to survive. Shocking footage has been released from the U.S.-Mexico border where migrant children have been marked with numbers. Footage has emerged showing numbers written in black ink on the arms of children while their families have been stuck for weeks at a migrant shelter, Casa del Migrante. It's not yet known how and when the practice of tracking migrants numerically began. According to reports, it has become standard for all those seeking asylum at a number of ports of entry into the United States. And the U.S. has committed billions of dollars towards development in Mexico and Central America, according to the Mexican and U.S. governments. Both administrations said it is part of a plan to strengthen economic growth and to curb migration in the region. The money will be allocated to existing aid programs as well as new loans and private sector support.
We want to address the underlying causes of migration so that citizens can build better lives for themselves and their families at home. The prosecution in Argentina has requested 22 years in prison for the social activist Malagro Sala. She's accused of criminal association. Our correspondent in Buenos Aires, Sabrina Roth, has those details. The prosecution has requested 22 years in prison for Milagro Sala on the grounds of criminal association. This is the third case opened against the social activist. It started on January 16, when Sala was arrested for participating in a protest, even though the demonstration was peaceful. The prosecution says Milagro Sala is the head of a criminal association and has committed fraud and extortion against the state. However, we still need to wait for the plea made by the other parties, and of course by the defense, which rejects these accusations and will point out all of the irregularities that have occurred during this judicial process. It is estimated that it will take two weeks for all the pleas to be presented. After that, we will learn Milagro Sala's sentence. In this, the third judicial process she has had to face. She remains in detention. Ecuador's National Assembly has approved several reforms to the communication law passed five years ago by the government of Rafael Correa. The reforms eliminated the articles that regulated the media, as well as those on administrative and economic sanctions on media organizations. Reforms also touched on the protection against media tax and the renewal of radio and TV frequencies. Opposition party says this law doesn't allow for freedom of expression. And staying in Ecuador, the government of Lenin Moreno has announced new economic measures, including rising gas prices, as well as reducing wages and jobs. Our correspondent, Denise Herrera, in Quito, tells us more. Minister of Economy Richard Martinez, alongside Labor Minister Raul Edesma and the Secretary of the President, Sebastián Roldán, stated that the cost of gasoline will rise from 1.48 to 1.85 per gallon. They stated that the diesel for public transport and domestic use won't be modified and say that it won't affect taxis. As President Lenin Moreno ordered, we've decided to cut the subsidy generated by dirty markets. This is inefficient and hampers our ability to fulfill our social obligations, such as revealing the real numbers. As we said, this was ordered by our president, so we've decided to reduce the subsidy for extra and eco par fuel. The National Assembly held its debate on the 2019 general budget. The budget includes the allocation of funding for education, health, universities and a system to prevent violence against women. The Citizen Revolution Movement rejected the budget. They expressed that with this bill, 2019 will be the year of austerity. The most concerning announcement is the cut to gas subsidy. The fuel's price will increase by 46%, meaning that it will increase from $1.17 per gallon to $1.71. We must also consider the other prices. An increase of 19% in diesel shows that the government won't fulfill its plan, but instead it is applying neoliberal policies. The question is, are they deciding this on their own, or are they following the IMF's orders so that the country gets loans to finance the coming year? Citizens are rejecting these measures. This will affect everyone, because even the poorest, who may be using older vehicles, will have to pay more. The minister is a business owner. He won't be affected, but the people will. I was expecting this due to the change in the country's politics. It is us. The citizens who will be directly affected, the ones who work in the streets, will feel the damage. According to President Lenin Moreno, these measures will amount to a saving of $700 million, which will transfer to the national treasury to be used to protect health care, pensions, public loans, and for debt relief for the middle class. Denise Herrera, Telesur, Ecuador. We'll take a short break now. More news in a minute.
Welcome back. Port workers in the Chilean city of Valparaiso have rejected a government proposal to end their strike, which has gone on for more than 30 days. The workers are demanding better conditions. Our correspondent in Chile, Paolo Dragnich, brings us more up to date. There are clashes happening right now between the port workers and security forces here in the city of Valparaiso. The port workers have rejected the government's proposal that would have brought their strike to an end and then immediately began to protest. Security forces set out to repress the demonstrations straight away. That's the story of what's been happening in the past few days. It doesn't look like this is going to come to an end anytime soon. There are more massive demonstrations planned for the afternoon and universities have offered their support to the port workers by going on strike as well. Guatemalan President Jimmy Morales has given a 72-hour deadline to the International Commission Against Impunity to leave the country. There are 11 commission officials left who have been investigating corruption cases throughout the country. Earlier this year, Morales banned the head of the commission from re-entering Guatemala, announcing that the commission's mandate would not be renewed. This after the anti-corruption body launched a series of investigations against high-level officials. Morales and his family were part of a multiple corruption investigation. And our correspondent in Guatemala City, Mario Rosales, has more on this story. Social organizations and two lawyers in Guatemala have filed three complaints in the Constitutional Court against the decision made by President Jimmy Morales to expel 11 researchers from the International Commission Against Impunity. They say the decision of expelling them is not legal, given the accords between the Guatemalan state and the United Nations on the creation of the commission. They say that only the chief of the organization is entitled to withdraw the immunity, to withdraw the immunity of these researchers, so the Guatemalan state cannot decide by itself on this matter. Now, the Constitutional Court will have to decide on the issue. The government of President Jimmy Morales has had different disputes with the commission over the past few years. Now to Venezuela, the, where the president of the National Constituent Assembly, Diosdado Cabello, has denied rumors that Russia planned to build a military base near Caracas. I wish it were true. Not one, but two, three, four, ten. It's not the Russians. We are the ones who want this country. We are the patriots who are going to defend this country in good times and in bad times. Mexico is often described as an intoxicating place for artists. The country's thriving creative scene has given rise to a new generation of artistic talent. However, these cultural practitioners now fear that proposed budget cuts will threaten the sector's viability and create a culture crisis. Artists gather outside Congress to protest what they say is a cultural crisis. The 2019 budget proposes significant cuts in arts funding. The cultural practitioners want to meet with no less than the president of the Budget Commission. We want a revision on the budget for culture. We are concerned about the cuts it has suffered. A number of programs have been cut in various sectors. According to official sources, the government has said it wants to reduce the so-called superfluous expenses. We understand there is a need of an austerity program and that certain expenses and privileges should be deleted. But we are worried because there are 500 programs at risk. Artists also lament that most of the cultural programs take place in the capital city, while provinces are left out. Culture is basic and fundamental to understand our society, to understand our current issues and the effect they have on us, like social insecurity. They say the full impact of the funding cut will be felt not only by practitioners, but the wider society. The new government has said that economic development is not enough, that we also need to develop our souls, so then we need culture for that. On December 15th, the public budget for 2019 was presented in Congress. Lawmakers have until December 31st to present any changes to the fiscal package and approve it. Cuba's National Assembly said the proposed reform of the Constitution that would have allowed for some same-sex marriage, for same-sex marriage actually, will be discussed in a family code. Our correspondent, Eliane Fernandez, explains this and other reforms. 
Cuba's State Secretary Omer Acosta has informed lawmakers on some of the results of the referendum that has been taking place over the past few months where citizens have been given their thoughts on the text of a new constitution. He also announced close to 9 million Cubans took part in this process, and nearly 60 percent of the current constitution has been rewritten. Acosta asked lawmakers in charge of drafting the new constitution to consider the results of the referendum. He also mentioned some of the most controversial topics in the next text, among them Article 68, which proposed defining marriage as the union between two people, which would have opened the door of same-sex marriage. Acosta told lawmakers that this debate will be postponed and to not specify the subjects who are allowed to be married, but to leave the definition of marriage itself as a legal and social institution. He asked them to make a proposal for a family code, which will need to be debated by parliament and then taken to a referendum. Acosta also talked about another important amendment, which is limiting presidents to two terms in office and brought up demands by citizens to see an increase in wage for Republic workers. Other issues are said to be debated by lawmakers. As they study the draft of the new constitution, if this text is approved, citizens will take to the polls next year to either approve or reject the new constitution. We'll take a short break now and we'll have more news after this. Welcome back. A rally has been held in Yemen's capital Sana'a to support the ceasefire agreement in Hodeidah. Members of the Houthi movement chanted and danced in support of the ceasefire that started in the port city on Tuesday at midnight. This is the first truce between the Houthi rebels and the Saudi-backed Yemeni government in more than two years. And just four days ahead of the presidential election in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the governor of the capital, Kinshasa, has banned rallies citing security reasons. Joint opposition party candidate Martin Fayulu was scheduled to hold a rally in the capital on Wednesdays, but the authorities prevented him from entering the city. While the party of another opposition candidate, Felix Shikedi, rejected the decision and said that they will continue to campaign. What is happening is that our president is blocked on the other side of the fence. The police are blocking his way. We don't need any mess. We just came to welcome our president and go with him. Therefore, faced with an unfair decision, we, UDPS, say no. And no, we will never allow this decision. It is illegal. It violates our rights and freedoms. Therefore, we will follow the electoral calendar. Uganda's border with the Democratic Republic of Congo remains on high alert as authorities increase their efforts to stop the spread of Ebola. People crossing the border have to wash their hands and shoes in chlorinated water. They also have to have their temperature taken for signs of fever before they are allowed to cross into Uganda. More than 300 people have died of Ebola since the Democratic Republic of Congo declared a new outbreak in August. We have established six screening points at the main point of entry called Mbondwe, where we do screening and on a daily basis, on a very busy day, we go as far as 30 people screened. screened. Of course, we have also established other uh, screening points. You know, the, our border with the DRC is so porous and we've managed to, uh, to add another five screening points. Uh, beside is the, the main point of entry, which is Mbondwe. Yellow vest protests have now hit Taiwan. More on that and some of the other stories making news around the world. Thousands of protesters wearing yellow vests have marched in front of Taiwan's presidential palace, calling for tax and judicial reforms. They're also calling on the government to stop using fines and taxation as a means of political persecution against anti-government organizations. Taiwan's Yellow Vest movement started in 2016, 
rallying against unfair taxation. I'm coming here to protest the unjust tax system because the current tax system in Taiwan is very intransparent and uh, unstable and you can see lots of fraud in this tax system. So this caused lots of foreign companies retrieving their investment from Taiwan and also lots of uh, local companies cease operating and that seriously impacts our working environments. Quiet fell over the Yemeni port city of Hodeida as forces from both the Saudi-backed Yemeni government and Houthi rebels observed the UN broker ceasefire. The truce, which was hammered out after a week of peace talks in Sweden, will see all forces withdrawn from Hodeida in the coming month. They will be replaced by so-called local security forces. Nine crew members of a cargo ship who were stranded aboard their vessel have been brought to safety in Turkey. They were rescued using a zip line after heavy winds caused the vessel to run aground just off of Istanbul's coastal district of Sile. Emergency workers are still trying to rescue seven others. The first post-budget bailout has been approved by the Greek parliament. It includes some social measures and leaves out pension reduction. Our correspondent in Greece, Habai Abide, brings us those details. With 154 votes in favor, the 2019 budget has been approved by Parliament. All lawmakers from the Syriza government coalition voted in favor, as well as an independent member of Parliament and a center union representative. Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras said that this budget is a political success, as it does not include the pension cut that the Troika had decided on for 2019 and 2020. In August 2018, the Troika imposed a new fiscal adjustment to pensions for the 14th time. However, it has not been included in the budget because the creditors accepted the forecast set up by the Greek government, which said that the Greece economy will grow by 2.5% next year, with a GDP surplus of 3.6%, and that unemployment will drop from its current level of 18% to 16%. The opposition have said that this is the final budget to be presented by Tsipras and his government, as the right wing will win next year's elections. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez and Catalan President Kim Toro could hold a meeting this Thursday to discuss the situation in Catalonia. Our correspondent John Ortiz has the latest details. There are still no details about the meeting between Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez and Catalan President Kim Tora, as they are still negotiating what will be up for discussion. However, the meeting itself has been confirmed. The Catalan government wants to speak with the Spanish government as equals, but the Spanish government wants to make the hierarchy between both parties clear, saying that Sanchez is the Prime Minister of a country, while Tora is the leader of an autonomous community. It is unclear if other government ministers will be present at the meeting. What we do know is that the popular response to the meeting is already being organized. Social organizations have planned a citizens' council, and there will be protests in Barcelona. On Friday, a meeting of the Spanish cabinet is planned in Catalan's capital, and the Spanish and Catalan leaders will meet on Thursday. On Friday evening, supporters of Catalan independence will march in the city. The union demonstration will take place at the same time. Christmas decorations are lighting up Syria's capital, Damascus. The city is marking its first holiday season since the government regained control of most, most of the country. A 30 meter high Christmas tree has been set up in the city center. The decorations are bringing light back to the capital after seven years of civil war. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at tellusyourenglish.net. And join us on social media. We can be found on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Sony Gray. Thank you for watching.